Good morning, everybody. It is great to be here with you today. And uh, we'll talk a little bit today about some of the cool ways that physicians are starting to experiment with Toyota Kata. So uh, at KataCon this time last year, I was in the process of leaving Southwest Louisiana, and I was headed out toward the Bay Area of California, specifically the East Bay Oakland area to join Kaiser Permanente. And um, you know, you can imagine, maybe slightly different between Cajun country and you know Silicon Valley and Napa, right? I, I was anticipating some differences, and sure enough, there were. I'm, I'm kind of a foodie, so I'm always putting it in food terms. You know, I was wondering if I was going to be able to get some gumbo out on the West Coast, and no, you pretty much can't get good gumbo. But they got this thing called chapino. Am I saying that right, Heather? Chapino. Okay, I always get it wrong, but it's pretty good. So it's like a nice, pleasant surprise, and you know, even with all the differences, surely there are differences in cultures and political and all that stuff, but you know, uh, there's been a lot of pleasant surprises about how similar things are because when it comes down to it, a lot of times, you know, people are people, brains are brains, and it's kind of reassuring. For example, it's consistent from culture to culture that we all have these reflexes that we have to overcome, right? These reflexes to jump to conclusions, filling in the blanks, you know, we're not great at recognizing our knowledge thresholds. That's common across cultures, across parts of the country. So that's the confirmation of what we thought. And then same thing with deliberate practice, the other component of Toyota Kata. So it turns out it's really useful to be able to intervene with starter Kata, with practice routines at the behavioral level so that we can uh, act our way to new mindsets. Still quite useful, doesn't matter whether it's Cajun country or the Bay Area. And the truest of all truisms is People really love the caught in the classroom exercise. I'm telling you, if you haven't done it, you really should. We've started to do it just kind of left and right all over the place. Here's one of uh, Mike down in UCLA doing it a few months back. It's really easy, uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's also very effective. So if you haven't given it a try, like next week, go ahead and do it. Just get a pack, you, can, you don't have to do it with a puzzle, you can do it with a deck of playing cards as well. And you can contact me if you uh, want some uh, advice on how to do that. But this, this, by the way, this strategy of uh, kind of rolling out all these caught in the classroom sessions, uh, it wasn't actually my preferred approach. What I'm accustomed to when deploying kata within an organization is you have more structure. You have, like we saw with Baptist, a, a shepherding group and advanced teams, etc. But my my boss at, at Kaiser Permanente is a very uh, he's very in tune with the culture of our medical group. He said, you know, we have a very collegial culture and if we just sprinkle a little bit of learning out there and put some of this information out there we have very engaged physicians they're going to kind of pick up some of this stuff and run with it and so let's just see what happens let's do it as an experiment pretend like we're just doing a bunch of uh, beakers and we're running a bunch of little experiments little petri dishes and so i was a little kind of nervous about it but you know we remember when we did the uh the the attempt at doing the blind spot exercise yesterday you know i had to recognize that i had that blind spot that maybe this culture is a little bit different than what I was accustomed to. So we gave it a try and lo and behold, some really cool use cases for Toyota Kata emerged with our physicians, driven by the physicians. And uh, I'm gonna share a few of those today. So first one, um, physicians coaching other physicians. So there's a process by which physicians and patients communicate and sometimes doctors struggle with it. So we have mentors that kind of will uh, observe the uh, communication process and help improve. Uh, but now we're kind of turning those mentors into more of coaches using the coach and kata approach. And it's been really cool because not only is it kind of you know, putting the physician in the front lines in the role of a learner that can work on their own bedside manner and those sorts of things, which is great, but also these mentors, you know, they're starting to see ways to improve uh, workflows for physicians so that the overburden on them is not so much, so that we can take out some of the waste of their day, add more joy and meaning and practice. And that also contributes to that relationship with the patient and the ability to really deliver a great care experience. So it's been pretty cool. Number two, uh, medical education. So we talked about um, Mike's passion yesterday about introducing COD into the K through 12 world. Now we're seeing also in medical schools, residency programs, et cetera. You know, we, we did the COD in the classroom training for like a few of the faculty members, physicians that teach other physicians. And uh, they kind of squirreled away a couple of the puzzles put in their backpack and said, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. And I was like, what are they doing with that? 
Well, what they were doing is they were going to the UCSF medical school and apparently, according to Twitter, they were crushing the puzzle exercise. They, were, they just went and taught it, you know, they just ran with it. So it's really cool to see that uh, other branch of education because these are the docs of the future, right? So, and then by the way, of course they're exposed to scientific thinking in medical school, but not necessarily how to teach that, not necessarily deliver practice for how to develop that in others. So uh, as these folks become our future leaders in the healthcare world, pretty cool to see that. Number three, in the inpatient setting, in a hospital, we were talking with some hospitalists about, wouldn't it be cool if when you went into the patient's room, there was a board and there was like the striving model up there like that, and uh, if we could talk about what does awesome look like, you know, long-term well-being, getting you back to health, where, whatever your baseline is. But the current condition is, you just got admitted into a hospital, okay? You're sick, and let's set a target condition that we believe we can achieve. Let's say, for this disease, we think that we can get home in three days, that's typical. And so we're gonna strive as a team, patient, family, physician, nurses, care coordinators, to get to that target condition. But there's all these obstacles in the way, right? So imagine a scenario where you can see all these obstacles that are preventing you from being able to get home start to dwindle over time. How much positivity could that bring to the hospital stay, which is not how normally when it's, you're approaching discharge date, I'm speaking from personal experience here, having been a patient, when you approach that discharge day, it can be very, very kind of negative and stressful and anxiety ridden. That's not helping your health, but if you can start to see that dwindling obstacles list, probably pretty cool. But by far my favorite uh, example of docs just kind of taking cotton and running with it was in our OBGYN clinic, where we had a, a doc that was uh, treating a pregnant patient. And uh, so they said, the patient was struggling a little bit, but they said, what's the overarching challenge? Well, we're, we're like a few months into the pregnancy, so we got like five months to go, and we want to have a safe delivery, healthy mom, healthy baby. That's what we're shooting for. We got like a five month time frame. And then pardon the use of uh, emojis, I know they're overused, but I didn't know how else to represent it. The situation in the current reality was that the patient was decompensating. Psychosocial issues, stressors, causing a lot of tension, and the patient was physically starting to decompensate. And so the doc said, you know, I just went through two hours of kata training, I think I'm gonna try this out with a patient. And they said, let's establish a target condition. And so uh, they said, you know, however they measure stress levels or whatever, but they said, by your next visit, when you come back in, uh, we want you to have your stress level down to here. And there's all these obstacles in the way, all these psychosocial triggers and stressors that were in that patient's life that we're gonna have to be able to develop some resilience against. And so they started running experiments such as, let's use a mindfulness app, let's practice meditation. And guess what, it, it worked. It worked really well. They got to a term, they had a successful delivery safe baby, safe mama. And it was, it was beautiful. So I asked uh, Dr. Carla Wicks, the OBGYN doc, to just reflect on her experience of having stepped out of that role of expert into the role of coach. So I'm sitting here with Dr. Carla Wicks, and uh, I have a few questions for you, Carla, related to your experiment with trying the coaching kata with one of your patients. Perfect. And so, uh, first of all, what inspired you to, after only having a couple of hours of kata training, to start using it with a patient having not seen that before? Well, I think that learning this new method really helped me to think about some of the big problems that I tackle with my obstetric and gynecology patients um, on a daily basis. And sometimes a challenge in working with patients in such a small period of time is that we think about the big problems, but we don't think about how we can break those big problems down into small goals and experiments for these patients to really work on. So you saw some potential there. Yeah. And then, I, and, you know, I will have shared the, the example with the audience of, of how you approached it with your patient. What did it feel like for you as the physician kind of being in the role of coach, which is not the traditional role that a physician may have been taught to play? How did that feel? Well, I think that it helped to change the dynamic in the room where I was no longer the expert I really was help I really work on helping my patients to become experts in their own um, behavior change or their own health health needs and so for me it was a big shift in how I approach problems and partner with patients 
Now, do you think that that is something that has potential for growth in healthcare? Or is it only for rock stars like yourself? No way. I think, um, you know, some of the larger challenges in, in working with patients, there is a slight dynamic um, where patients feel as though there may be a little power dynamic and they may not necessarily own their own work and, and changing their own health outcomes. And what I think this does is that it em empowers the patients to engage in the process. And it also simplifies the bigger problems into small, more attainable goals for them to achieve. So I think it's applicable in any situation, not just my own. That's, that's very encouraging. And thank you so much for your excellent work. Awesome. Thank you for, for being the teacher. And with that, I'd like to also thank you all for being teachers. Have a coach, be a coach, and have a great rest of your day.